Hey folks, it's your pal Mike Shea. Ooh, my camera's weird. Let's get that fixed. Oh, there we go. Mike Shea from slyflourish.com and twitter.com slash slyflourish. Here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. Uh, normally in this show, uh, I go over the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my Sunday D&D game. But I have no game today. So today I thought I would just open it up and we'll talk about D&D. Uh, we can also, uh, if people desire, uh, those of you who are in chat today will have a lot of freedom to guide the direction of this show because uh, I'm happy to talk about just about anything. And um, But if nobody really has any ideas, I could talk about my Wednesday Shadow of the Demon Lord game. Uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord is a role-playing game by Robert Schwab, one of the developers of 3rd uh, and 4th edition D&D, 3rd, 4th, and 5th edition D&D. Uh, he also made uh, Song of Ice and Fire RPG for Green Running, and he made Shadow of the Demon Lord his own RPG. And uh, I have, I bought it years ago, and I've been reading about it a long time, and I played it at conventions, but for the first time I've actually been running a campaign in, in this system, and I thought it'd be fun to talk about that. Uh, normally this show goes an hour, we'll see if we go the full hour today. Uh, there are a couple of variables uh, in how long our show will be. One is uh, what we have to talk about and whether or not it remains interesting, I don't want to waste people's time. And two is uh, whether my voice holds up. I've got either a cold, again, it's like my third cold this year, or I have uh, allergies. But either way, it's affecting my voice. I have a great big bottle of water to, to aid in this, but uh, uh, we will see. So, hey, my mom is here. Hello, mom. Uh, Evil John is here. Ka Kaltha is here as well. So, um, there's, you know, I'm always trying to figure out, like, how many people are actually listening in. I can never figure it out. I never, never really am able to see. Um, so, if you guys in chat have any uh, topics, role-playing game or D&D &D topics uh, or lazy DM topics of choice that you want to talk about today, feel free to throw it into the chat, and I will uh, throw it into the mix. Uh, otherwise, I will just pontificate my own my own desires my own nonsense so let me know uh i you know, i'm terrible i'm a terrible twitch person i don't know how to oh yeah 16 people here okay plenty of people here so those of you 16 people um uh versimar versimi cover says thanks for checking out my wandering monsters dnd cast yeah i did it was cool thank you for thank you for posting it and and yeah it was it was it was neat i got to check it out a lot of great stuff out there, man. There's, there's so much stuff nobody can keep up. We are we are now hitting the point where the content has outstripped. Um, uh, the content has outstripped. Ah, Joe Kupski is here. Joe is the player in my Sunday game. And the fact that we're not having a Sunday game means he can be in the chat and hear all about the Shadow of the Demon Lord game. So, okay, I got a request. Reaper Bones Kickstarter for his ship. Yeah, so I, I wrote a list of... Let me switch over here. Pull up OBS. I wrote a list of like shit to talk about and uh one of the things i talked about was the fact that the reaper bones has shipped and uh i saw tom lamell uh who goes by six hit points on twitter um he got his i guess it went west coast to east coast so he received his and opened it up and it looks cool i the thing that's freaking me out and i went he recommended buying a lot of glue and i went and bought a lot of glue is a great number of the minis have multiple uh, I have glue glue pieces, lots of glue pieces on those, and I'm not super excited about that. <laughs> like, you know, I kind of like that you can sort of take them right out. Of I mean, I'm going to paint many of them anyway. I'm really, I am, I am over saturated with miniatures at this point. I don't think I've, you know, I've painted so many minis, and I have so many that have not yet been painted. I now have boxes and boxes of the previous three Kickstarters up in my up in my little painting room. Uh, which was also our guest room. And uh, I know I'm just going to be adding a bunch more. I'm also interested about the gray primer. Or it's not primer, but the, the, they, they changed the consistency of the mini itself to a gray plastic. Uh, I presume it's still PVC. Um, but we'll see if it paints any better. We'll see if it holds paint any better. One of the problems with the old Reaper Bones is that they didn't hold paint particularly well, I found. No matter whether I primed them or not, the priming worked. You know, if you prime it with the right stuff... Um, but yeah, a lot of the uh, a lot of mine that I a lot of the early ones I did uh, have chipped. So um, 
Evil John says, great plastic, still going to use Gesso on it. Yeah, and the problem with like, Gesso is, you know, Gesso is a really great primer because you can buy it at art stores for like $3 for a giant tube, and you can prime the hell out of everything with that. So it's very cost effective. And it also stays a little rubbery, which means it will hold paint really well, and it shouldn't chip because it will. Um, it, it doesn't chip because they, uh, it'll, it'll flex. So everything you wanted to know about painting miniatures. I'll tell you what mini, miniatures I really love. I think, you know, the Reaper bones are great. Like dollar per mini is ridiculous. It's, I don't know, it's like 30 cents a mini or something like that, um, which is way better than the cost for the uh, WizKids um, unpainted D&D minis. But the WizKids unpainted D&D minis are really nice too. I bought a few of those. And I think for player character minis, Nulzers, yeah, Nulzers magnificent minis. Uh, I've, I've bought a few of those to, to, you know, mostly at my FLGS and, uh, they look, they look great. Hey, Tilda to Wilda's here. Hello. So, yeah, so I'm getting mine on Wednesday. And, uh, so I guess Thursday I will dig through them and pop them all out and I'll probably glue them all like, you know, once I'll glue all the ones I care about. I, you know, it's always like a big event when the Reaper stuff shows, cause there's like 300 minis and you got to figure out what to do with them. Um, Joe Kupski says, Nulzer likes Nulzer better. Yeah, Nulzers are definitely better than Reapers. They also cost about 10 times as much, you know, or at least five times as much. Um, and But they are pre-primed, which means they hold paint really well. So, my yeah, the Nulzer minis I've got are really fantastic. They're, they're very good. Uh, Devin Carr says, I got a question to throw on the pile. What are some of the effective ways you've found to provide post-game summaries? You, that is very interesting. What do you think is most important to include and what do you prefer? Uh, my wife was mentioning, uh, and on, we were going out for a walk and she said, how about talking about what you prep after the game, which is a little the, the same as what you're asking. Not quite. Um, and, uh, so what I do for summaries, and I, I this is a, a recommendation that I put in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Joe Kupski here can, can, uh, uh, he can, he can talk about how it actually works at the table because he's, he's often the one doing it. I like to throw it back to the players and have them summarize what happened in the last game. And there's a couple, and, uh, Matt Colville also recommends this and then the videos he does. Uh, the reason why is you get a better idea of what the character, what the players are paying attention to and what got lost and what, you know, where, uh, uh, you know, where they think things are going versus where you think things are going. And I think it's a, you know, one of the things I've been really interested in recently is player feedback. How do you get feedback about the game? Well, one way to get good feedback is to ask them, ask the group, like what, who would like to talk, and this is a question I bring up, who would like to talk about what happened in last week's game? And um, you get a lot of different things. A lot of times you get players who like to talk about what their character did in the last game, and that's okay, that's reasonable. But then some of you, somebody usually comes up with, oh yeah, that's what happened in the story, or this is where we ended. And sometimes it goes backward to front. You get a really good idea about like where things are, you know, what's in their memory. And it's not so you can steer them or correct them. Sometimes you might have to. Sometimes if there's a major plot point that sort of got lost, you might have to throw it back out there. But it also tells you like what they remembered and then you could sort of flex the world around their drive. If, if you had a really complicated, you know, five different empires all fighting and everyone doesn't remember it because they've been in a cave all this time, well, maybe the five empire thing goes away. You know, you, it gives you an, a way to steer the game uh, away from, uh, you know, whatever is not getting their interest or doesn't really matter to them. So, um, you know, that, that works really well. Uh, Joe says, works well when I try it with my sons. Amazing what they remember and amazing how many notes they have on their iPads using both D&D Beyond and Notes app. That's awesome. Yeah, so Joe is one of those absolute awesome players who takes copious notes during the game. Uh, Joe draw, and I'm glad that it, that is a, I'm glad that that has made it down, uh, through the generations to his sons. Uh, he draws maps like old school maps. He, he takes notes. So whenever we talk about what happened last week's game, he almost always is the one who's able to very, you know, put together a real clear outline. And, uh, that's a really good trick as a player too. Something that if DMs have the opportunity to kind of, you know, recommend to their players, I know I'm a fidgety player. I get bored because, you know, other people are taking their turns and I want to do my stuff or I'm just thinking about other things. And it's real easy to like go pull up your iPhone or iPad and start playing a game or go check Twitter or whatever. But taking notes during the game makes you sort of pay attention to what's going on. You know, writing out like what are the story, who are the names of the people, drawing out maps. I did that now and I'm trying to do that more at conventions when I play. I'm a terrible player. I'm much happier as a DM. And, uh, but when I do play, uh, I want to take better notes like that because it brings, it's really a way to enjoy the game more, right? It's, it's, it's really something where 
as a player, you can really enjoy the game. So embrace those uh, players who take notes. And uh, if you happen to be playing take notes yourself, it's a great way to stay engaged with the game and, and, and keep everything real, keep the whole game more cohesive. So yeah, it, that, that works really well. And that idea of kind of bringing it back to the, um, bring it back to the players is, is what I do for, um, for post-game summaries. Uh, so then another question is, what do you do as a DM after the game? And if you've seen, I don't know if I have this. Um, I don't have it here. Did I do it in the seventh? I might've done it in the seventh. I didn't do it then either. Wow, I suck. So you can see here, I have like little after game notes. Uh, I should probably shouldn't put these up because Joe's here and he'll see what's going on. Um, but I'll, let me let me see. Hang on, I've got another one. Watching Mike navigate his. Let's pull up the, I think it, let's try the 24th. So this is my Shadow of the Demon Lord games. Yeah, so what I started doing is keeping track. Now we're good, Joe. Um, what I did is I started keeping track of what happened after the game. And then as soon as I can after the game, I think I did this the morning, the morning after, uh, I have a new section of my game notes called like previous games notes, right? Or here I just call them game. Um, uh, spelling. And uh, it's just me kind of going through uh, a list of like what happened in the last game. And it's a way for me to keep track of it. And it probably helps me. Uh, in my game prep. This is something I've only just started doing. It's probably something I should have been doing for a long time. Uh, I think it's really useful. So um, I think it's useful. I mean, I'm still figuring it out because sometimes it's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in the idea of letting ideas flow and flow away and then see what comes back, you know, that, that we, not everything is important. So we don't have to keep notes on everything. But um, in this case, you know, I don't know, I'm going to give it a shot and take more notes. And basically, it's like as close as you can to the end of the game, sit down and write down like what happened and what are the hooks and threads that you think are interesting. Particularly, are there entry, any NPCs that you want to bring in that that really matter? Um, I think that that I think that that can help. So, yeah. So uh, why don't I talk a little bit about Shadow of the Demon Lord? Uh, I love this picture. You see the picture down below. I love this idea of a person summoning a bone devil and the bone devil is giving the emoji equivalent of a shrug you know like the shrug emoji one of my favorite emojis ever uh, i just love that you summon this horrible barb demon bone devil from the nine hells and it's like i don't know the answer to your question um let's see uh Rakendal says i don't find taking notes after the game useful things worth remembering tend to stick anyway yeah that's that's the thought that's actually um i stephen king was the first time i heard this where people's like oh you know what what's your note taking technique how do you keep track of good ideas he's like i don't keep track of good ideas good ideas come back to me so you know if i'm out there and i'm thinking about a good idea you know if it's really good i can't get rid of it yeah there's the shrug emoji evil john's got the shrug emoji isn't that great um I actually have that hot wired on my phone so I could type in three characters and drop in the shrug emoji because it's the most powerful, you know, powerful emoji anyway. Uh, so, um, yeah, I do take notes for future ideas my players give me. It's kind of the same thing a little bit. So, yeah, I don't know. But, yeah, so Stephen King is a big, big believer in kind of letting good ideas go away. But I'm trying it out. I think, I think that there are details. The reason why I think it's important to take notes after the game or why I'm bothering to try it this time is I think that my games have a, have a loose consistency to them, that, like, they don't feel super solid. And it's because we kind of know that an event might take place during a game and we all kind of know it might not ever come back up again. Did that event ever even really occur? So I think it's, it's you know, keeping notes kind of keeps a, a, a level of consistency in the world that makes the world feel more solid. If we know that Mike is remembering things that we did, we know that the world is going to happen the way we thought it happens rather than like, oh, no, that didn't happen at all. And sometimes I do a lot of, you know, like like retconning of things. Not a lot, but occasionally we'll retcon stuff like, oh, yeah, what was that guy's name? And no one remembers like, well, we're giving him a new name now. And then it just feels less real. It feels less, less solid. So, yeah, I think that that's I think that's one reason to, to do it. All right, let me talk about Shadow of the Demon Lord. I hope not to bore people. I know sometimes talking about other game systems when people are here to talk about D&D can get a little bit boring. So I will try to keep the conversation relevant to D&D as well, like thoughts about, you know, comparing and contrasting, you know, this this with D&D. Uh, let me drop back over to... I will keep my notes about what we're going to talk about, and then we will just 
bring up the Shadow of the Demon Lord. So like I said, Shadow of the Demon Lord is a uh, game by Robert Schwab. It is a uh, pretty, it, it, it's, it, it fits this really interesting balance between loose and crunchy. Uh, it, it definitely has a lot of crunch. And one of the reasons why my players like it so much is that, um, and they do, my, my players are, 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 are happy with it. Um, let's see if I can... Uh, um, the reason why my players are happy with it is because it does have a good deal of character crunch in it. Um, oops, that wasn't the right one. Sorry. Wrong URL. Um, <clears throat> so Shadow of the Demon Lord is its kind of loose. Uh, it's very fast paced. There's a fair bit of, it's not super tactical. Um, so it's, it's definitely has lighter rules than fifth edition has. Um, and a lot of the design philosophy is run campaigns, run short campaigns. They're definitely uh, in the realm of fantasy horror uh, with an underlined underneath horror. And I'll talk, I mean, obviously from the theme, as you can see from that crazy cover, but also, and the theme is, you know, pretty extreme, but also even in the mechanics of it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, that, the, the, the kind of issue with some of the mechanics and how to keep that pace of horror going the whole time. Um, really cool character concepts. My players loved uh, the, the level zero characters, just kind of thinking about their, you get two professions when you start. It's sort of like your backgrounds from D&D. And uh, they really, you know, they were some of the most cohesive bonding of characters that they, that happened, um, happened during the, um, uh, the initial character building session. Uh, I would say that more so than, there's a really cool picture I want to find somewhere. Uh, wasn't there, is it classes? This one, that's a great picture, humans. Uh, so, um, it, I think more so than in fifth edition, this campaign I've been running has had a lot more player interaction in what's been going on in the world. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that is that every session that I've run has been its own small adventure with a, about a two to three day break in between adventures so that the characters can be off doing things. And we start every session by saying, what has your character been up to? And we go around the table. What has the character been up to in the last two or three days since the end of whatever event occurred? And I try to take what they talk about and I throw secrets and clues in there. Secrets and clues turns out to be really valuable for this. Um, and, and sort of connect them back into whatever the next storyline is. So... Um, so the characters have a lot of, of uh, their backgrounds have a lot of connection into, um, uh, into the game. Uh, so it's, every campaign is intended to be 11 sessions. Uh, you start at level zero and you work your way up to level 10 and each adventure is uh, a level. Now, some people will play an adventure over multiple sessions, um, but I have not. I specifically wanted every level to be every session. So every adventure is pretty short because I run three hour games. Uh, so if it's a three hour game, uh, I want the entire game, I want the entire adventure to fit inside that three hours. And that's been a really hard and interesting, um, uh, really hard and interesting design limitation for me. Uh, and it's made it hard. Like, I, you know, I got to think about like, oh, how's this adventure going to work and how many locations do I come up with and stuff like that. And so uh, I'm trying to remember. So session zero uh, for our campaign. So I'm, I'm basing it loosely on a on a product called Tales of the Demon Lord. Um, and Tales is sort of Schwab's one to 11 or t zero to 10 campaign adventure that he wrote as part of the original Kickstarter. Uh, let me just pop that up here. And um, it's cool, uh, but about half of the adventures don't really fit the main theme of the, of the campaign. Uh, and I think like a lot of these were written in the earliest days. So uh, I really try to, so I've been breaking away from it. I used the first couple, and then since then, I sort of wrote my own thing. Uh, Joe asks, does that rush you? It does. It means that I have to keep the, like I'm always keeping track of time, and I'm always making sure that I can get through the full adventure in that time. So every so often, I kind of have to move people along. The other thing is I kind of let the players know, like we are going to finish this adventure tonight. 
So don't dally around. And it, it means a lot less sort of exploration and kind of talking to people. Like we don't really have a lot of town sequences. It's sort of like you're right. Every every adventure, you're right into the story. You know, the, the talk in the town is like what happens in that two days. So like one of the characters will say like, oh, yeah, I've been spending time with that crazy girl that is you know, this is like the 13 year old girl who's probably a 200 year old lich who is part of the uh, black cabal, the black, the cabal of the black sun. And um, I've been learning about my new trait. Because the characters are gaining a new ability every time, the way they get their ability is often by what they did during that three-day downtime. It's sort of, you know, that's, that's how they leveled. And so a lot of the stories will come from that. And then a lot of those stories will lead into the, the main story. Um, so I've been running Tales of the Demon Lord uh, loosely. Uh, at least the storyline is from Tales of the Demon Lord. Uh, and I'm stealing a lot of stuff from it, but it's really vague. So session zero for us was learning that the a group known as the Brotherhood of Shadow had stolen an artifact called the Eye of the Demon Lord from a vault that was buried underneath the town of Crossings. Crossings is this, you know, city with a lot of smog and pollution from the local engineering place. And uh, they uh, have been... Um, so there, there's, but there's like an ancient Feyan ruin underneath, an ancient Fey fairy ruin underneath the city. So they have these like sewers and stuff that are beneath, but the sewers are actually caves of the fairies. And most of the fairies are all gone. There's a couple that are left, but there's, so like there's Fey gates and stuff that are taken to the fairies. So session zero was learning that the Eye of the Demon Lord had been stolen and then going down there and rescuing a guy named Father Gregory, who was a priest of the new god. Uh, who had been taken by them and was being slowly dissected by a creature known as a harvester. And they killed the harvester. And the first thing I learned, these are some of my notes about like how to run Shadow and things I would do differently. Level zero, like this is obvious, is really, really squishy. Any creature that does more than 1d6 damage is going to like drop your characters really quick. So no matter what monster I throw at characters at level zero, they shouldn't do more than 1d6 damage. So damage output really matters. And that damage output really matters later on because you don't get a lot of hit points. You get like four or five hit points a level, three to five hit points a level. So you never really get a whole lot of extra hit points. The, the math on this is way flatter than even fifth edition. Like with fifth edition, your damage and hit points scale a lot. Uh, but in this one, the hit points and damage do not scale very much. Like really high down, 4d6 is a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, also, healing is really hard to do. You don't just heal uh, every night. You know, you don't just... Um, uh, you don't just get all your hit points back by resting. Uh, you actually have to rest multiple days. So if you rest two full 24-hour periods, you will get all of your hit points back, which is why we have a two to three day break between each session. It's like on top of you going around town and doing things, you've also been recovering. So that way, after the, at the beginning of every session, they're fresh. At the end of every session, they're expended. During the session, they do not really get a chance to rest. And they're not really going to recover hit points other than through magical means or through other character powers that they have. So um, it, it means that you're very in this session. You're very limited by what you by what you have. Um, uh, Zellspell says, "Couldn't your Derek character die in creation?" Yeah, you can actually die at level zero. You know, but I, I really like kind of you know if you're only going to have eleven sessions of a campaign, you don't want people to be switching characters a lot. Uh, yeah, healing is very first edition. Joe says the healing reminds of first edition. It is like that. And if you look in the optional rules in the DMG for fifth edition, they have like a long healing where you don't heal your full hit points except for a week. And this is similar to that. You get you get basically one quarter of your hit points back for every eight hours you rest. Um, and if you rest 24 hours, uh, I think it's, if you rest a full 24 hours, you get half. It's weird. But anyway, two two days is enough to get all your hit points back. So that's what we that's what I've been doing. It's like you it, we've had at least two days in between. And that way the story can kind of move forward. Um so uh what else? Uh I'm just looking through my notes on like things that I've noted. Um so one thing is that the play yeah, so it's 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 a fast system and the rules are pretty straightforward. Uh, you can actually buy the rules for really cheap. Uh it's called victims. Uh, Victims of the Demon Lord. And it's a, yeah, it's two bucks. It's the starter guide for, um, uh, it's the starter guide for uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. You can, it, you really, it's it's really light. Like it's just level zero. Um, 
but the price is right. If you want to just see the rules, it's a great way to like look at the rules. It's a big book. Like, you know, I think the Victims of the Demon Lord book is 50 pages for $2. So it's pretty worthwhile um, to show you what the system is. But you're only really going to be able to play. I don't even think you can play one session in because I think it doesn't have any monsters in it. You have to you have to get monsters and stuff. So it's really worth picking up the main PDF. Um, but while the rules are really light, players love the character progression because you get something pretty meaningful every session. And your um, and those those choices are big. So and there's a lot of choices because uh, you have your so when you start as a novice, you have your professions, two professions. Then when you I'm sorry, when as a starter, you have two professions. And then your novice path is the four main types like fighter, cleric, mage, uh, and rogue. Fighter, cleric, mage, rogue. And then you get your expert path at third level, and that gives you up to 16 different paths that you can take. And then at master level, at seventh, you get 64 different paths you can take. So, and you can mix all of them together. So the character, you're very unlikely to have characters that are similar to one another between your, your um, uh, origin, or, no, I forget what they call it, ancestry, which is like your race, your professions, your expert, your, your novice path, expert path, and master path. You're gonna every character is gonna be really unique. So the fact that they've managed to pack so many different kinds of options into one book is really pretty tremendous. And and again, like I've I've checked in with my players after our third session to be like, Are you guys having fun with this? Are we good? And they're like, Yeah, this is great. You know, everybody loves it. My except my wife, uh, Michelle is. It, it's a little too dark for Michelle, and it's kind of this. You know, she's like, Oh, it's really, you know. And it is like the theme of the game is very very dark. Um, most of my other players are just happy to watch the characters progress, so the darkness isn't really a big deal. And it's also a little bit slap, like it's so gory, it's a little bit slapsticky. So uh, that works. Um, one other thing that I would probably, so aside from making sure that I, I'm keeping a really careful eye on how much damage monsters do, the other thing that I'm keeping a really careful eye on and that, that I would do differently is the number of monsters that have the what they call the frightful, or the fright, frightening or horrifying trait. Um, and the reason this matters, if you're if you're familiar with, uh, let's see, with this one, and we will jump down to the monsters. Uh, yeah, so here's here's a good example. These are demons, right? They have sort of generic demons, um, and then you you can kind of add talents to the demon to to make them special. So a small demon you see is a size one half horrifying demon. Uh, you, so you have these horrifying ones. Here's a dragon, size two or three, frightening monster. And then the dire wolf, for example, is just a fairy. Um, so frightening means that as soon as you see it, you have to make an intellect check, which is sort of like a wisdom saving throw. And if you fail it, you are at three banes. You're at a, a pretty big disadvantage when fighting that monster. Um, if you see a horrifying creature, you have to make the same check, only this time you gain insanity, which is a, like a permanent level of fear, as well as getting frightened by it. And uh, this is part of that, this is the, like the mechanic behind the horror game. If you think about like Darkest Dungeon or some of these other games where you're, you're slowly going crazy as you're playing the game, this is that mechanic. You're slowly going crazy as you, as you play through Shadow of the Demon Lord. Um, the trick is that it seems like almost every monster has it, you know, so it's, yeah, this is like a madness check, right? Um, the problem is like almost everything has it so that like, you know, you're, you're like, you're almost, you're, you're fighting so many different creatures. And I wonder what percentage of them have either the frightening or the horrifying, but like basically all the undead does. Um, and, uh, all of the... You know all of the demons and like extra planar like you know creatures do so you know bloody bones and then and these are the creatures that i'm using a lot of right so um i mean it's kind of interesting a lot of these guys don't have it horror you know barrow white horrifying undead you know when you see it you go you go crazy the problem is it's if it happens too much it just gets boring like it, it's not like oh another freaking intellect check and oh i'm two banes you know um <laughs> Uh, Evil John says, frightening or horrifying conditions make your players feel positively unheroic. Have to be so careful with it because it removes agency from the players. So, yeah, Evil John, in, in, the nice thing in Shadow is that when you are frightened and horrified, it doesn't really paralyze your character. You're just at dis, you're, you're, it's not quite, they have a thing called boons and banes in Shadow. And essentially, 
a boon is an extra d6 that you add on to your d20 roll at any point, and a bane is a minus d6. Think about it like bless and curse in, in, in fifth edition. And if you have multiple boons and banes, you roll that many d6s, but you take the worst one. So the worst that a bane can do to you is minus six, and the best a boon can do is plus six. So if you are fighting a frightening creature, and you are in fact frightened because of your intellect roll, you're at three banes. So then if you add any boons or anything like that, you're subtracting from the banes. Um, but it, it, it doesn't completely kill you. Like all your actions are still there. You're still doing all the same stuff. So it's not like you're cowering in the corner and unable to act. You can still act. The problem is it just happens so often. So I think that I'm just going to limit which monsters have that to like the big, what, what are the biggest and most extreme monsters that you see in a, um, in a, in a particular adventure. And those are the ones that are going to inflict boons and banes. Like, not every weird creature. Um, so uh, Joe asks if it's D6 or not. It is D20. So your primary rolls are D20 rolls. It's just the, 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 in fact, the only dice you use are 20s and 6s. And your 20 is your, just like in, in, in 5th edition, uh, your D20 is used for all of your main um, checks. You know, whether you're attacking or whether you're doing a, the equivalent of a saving throw, you use a D20. The D6s you use for either damage or for... Um, your boons and banes. So boons and banes are closer to advantage and disadvantage than they are in anything else. The only difference is boons and banes will, they don't stack exactly. You, you never take, you always take the highest and they stack in the sense that if you have five boons and three banes, you have two boons. You're always subtracting, you know, boons and banes from things. Um, so uh, the, a D6 is pretty close to an advantage curve. Uh, it's about, what, three? The average on a D6 is 3.5. So it's pretty close. And the average on a, uh, I think the average bon benefit of an advantage is uh, if you're assuming a 50-50 shot is plus four or plus five. I think it's plus five if it's right on. If you have to roll exactly 11 or better, it's plus five. Any other number, it's usually plus three or plus four. So yeah, it's pretty close. It's pretty close to advantage to disadvantage. The only difference is that like you're, you're swinging up and down uh, depending on the amount you have. So, um, uh, yeah, so the, the frightening and horrifying stuff, I think it, I think it's overused. I think too many creatures have it. And there's some uh, house rules that I've seen. I, th I, th I think on Reddit I looked and, and people said that they were um, they were uh, uh, switching up their, their frightening and horrifying to creatures that were above a certain challenge level, depending on the character levels. And I kind of like that idea. Like maybe things that are more powerful than you that have the hor frightening or horrifying should matter. But things that are less powerful than you, maybe not so much. And, and I'm trying to limit it to like once or twice a uh, game rather than like all the time. So I think like every creature they fought in the last time, every one of them had either frightening or horrifying because they're fighting a lot of undead. So um, that is definitely something I would change. Uh, I'm going to drink. Try and I'm stuffed up. Uh... If everything is frightening, then nothing is. Yeah, that's kind of the way I feel. It's like it, it removes... Clearly, my players were more annoyed by it than they were frightened. And if a, if a demon crawls out of this thing, it should matter, right? And I, I like that, that, you know... So I think... I, I forget. I think there's a supplement. Um, there's a supplement that came out uh, where they give you boons and banes depending on the difficulty of the creature... I'm I'm looking for it real quick here. Uh, where's my other RPGs? Uh, let's do it by name. Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, I think it was in Poison Pages. And was it... Uh, Unhinge the Mind. It's a whole supplement for... Um... So one thing about Shadow is there is a ton of supplements. Oh my God. So Insanity... Horrifying creature intensity. Uh, uh, as described in Shadow, certain creatures are so disturbing and alien that the, one can get insanity from merely seeing them. Such grotesque horrifying creatures are intensity level determined by their difficulty, such that it becomes harder to resist gaining insanity for powerful creatures as shown. So, uh, yeah, the difficulty, the intensity, you'll get boons or banes depending on it. So... Um, a lot of it is like at this one's just got to try for insanity, but I think, I think that better is, um, uh, I think that better is, um, 
you know, just making it like if creatures are lower than you, then don't really worry about frightening or horrifying. Uh, poor Mikey sounds like a suffer. Yeah, I've got, conge I'm all congested. Sorry about that. I'm good though. Um, what is the difficulty level scale for monsters? So the scale for monsters is pretty, let me, let me pull that up here. Uh, I can find it. Da, da, da. Spells. Uh, there's a whole campaign where the book has a ton of stuff in it. It's a really cool book. Um, and uh, da, da, come on. There it is. So this is a um, chart that the, the very simple sort of how to build encounters, uh, you know, what's what's hard, easy, medium, or hard, challenging or hard. I don't know why hard and challenging are different. Uh, but also like the max creature difficulty. So the creatures, you have this difficulty score and you add the scores together to determine like how many monsters you can fight. Um, and then I think in the monster table, they actually have... Uh, where is it? Yeah, the recommended tier or group for a difficulty of a monster. So this is really the a better to me. It's a, a better, easier chart that like your your expert tiers are your monsters are fifty to one hundred or less, right? And then your master tiers are your fit two fifty to five hundred. They actually have some thousand difficulty monsters. I saw one rune giants or something. But almost everything in here, including the biggest demons, are 500. Um, so it's scale, and that's that. That's how it scales. You don't see any numbers that are different than these. The one, five, ten, twenty-five, fifties. Um, yeah, it's just the sum. So if you want, you know, you 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 basically say like, I don't want to have any monster that's bigger than a certain amount, and then I I can divide it up. So it's a little trickier. As you know, it, you can kind of do it in your head. You do have to pay a little bit of attention. Um, uh, Z101 says, can we ask any questions or do we want to just talk about Demon Lord? Ask any questions. Like I said, I know that not everybody wants to hear about Shadow of the Demon Lord all the time. Um, that we're here for talk about D&D. So feel free to ask any questions about D&D and we'll answer those as well. Uh, and I don't know that I have much else to talk about with Shadow. Uh, it's been really fun building the campaign. The, the, the way I built my campaign is, I'll, I'll just go through it real quick. So session zero, they found out that the eye of the Demon Lord was taken by the Brotherhood of Shadow. Uh, session two, they went to rescue a woman who had been kidnapped by a bunch of thugs only to find out that she was the daughter of a priest of the Brotherhood of Shadow and that she turned into a demon thing. That was worth a horrifying check, right? When she turns into that, but not everything is worth a horrifying check. So they rescued her, but then she turned into a demon and ended up killing it, killing people and they killed her. They pretended to be her and broke into the guy's house. And then the next session was they invaded the house of the priest to find notes that he had about the summoning of the demon lord. And what they discovered from the notes is that there are four anchors that are drawing the demon lord to the world. Uh, and then there are four breakers that can break each of the anchors. So the remaining eight sessions of the game, that was session, that was the first three sessions. The remaining eight sessions are collect the four anchor, the four breakers. Uh, and then the last four sessions are, are destroy the four anchors. And that way they will hopefully help prevent it. So now they, they know that structure. It gives me structure to write in that, okay, the first breaker was a was a Vorpal sword, and they had to go to the land of the fairy, and they had to go basically through the Jabberwocky poem, uh, and f they faced the Jabberwocky, but ran from it, and they collected the sword, which was out there in the stars, and pulled it down, and now they've got a Vorpal sword, and then immediately with a, you know, the player was kind of like waving it around, and the NPC was like, ooh, can I take a look? And he said, sure, and he, goes, and he just cut the NPC's head off, and that's where that the session ended. So, um, they beheaded their quest NPC, the guy that helped them get the sword. That was really depressing. Everybody was very surprised. Yeah, they got a Vorpal sword. So now they have it. And they're like in the middle of their level. So they're going to have that Vorpal sword for a long time. And the Vorpal sword in Shadow is really powerful. So um, yeah, because you, you behead when you roll a 20 or higher, including all your bonuses and stuff. And that's your five higher than their defense. Um, uh, what else? So... They then are, uh, next session, they're going after a thing called the Shard of Night, which is going to be in an undead, undead place. Uh, I'm stealing from my um, uh, Lazy DM workbook. I'm going to use the crypt, the crypt map from the Lazy DM workbook. Uh, they, um, uh, what else? 
So then they have a wand called the Wand of Blackfire, or the Blackfire Wand. And I don't know where did, oh, they're going to get that in one of the Fey Spires, these weird spires that are all over town. I think the Blackfire Wand will be in there. Oh, no, no, no. Blackfire Wand is in hell. So they have to go to an old monastery and then find a portal to hell and go and pluck it out of the portal to hell. That'll be fun. And then um, the last one is the Bone of the Innocent. And the Bone of the Innocent is a bone of Astrid, the prophet of the new god. And they have to break into the cathedral inside crossings to steal the bone. So that'll be fun. And then they have to kill the four anchors. And the anchors are a vampire queen, a demon prince, uh, a uh, evil tome, and the eye of the demon lord itself. And when they destroy all of those things, they will... Um, uh, they will they will succeed. So I, I have a nice outline for the remaining sessions. I kind of know where they're going to go. I haven't really filled them all out. I'm kind of letting the story sort of go wherever we want to go. But it gives me enough to kind of have an idea where we're going. Uh. Zed, did you have a question? Uh, it sounded like you had a question that was not necessarily about Shadow of the Demon Lord, but you can ask it. Uh, otherwise, we could talk about other things. So I like Shadow. I like it a lot. Uh, one thing I'm really looking forward to. So there, there's, you know, Schwab had a Kickstarter that he ran for a thing called Occult Philosophy. I kind of wish that was out before I ran this, but, you know, such is the time. Um, but in, I guess he said in next next year, he's going to be launching a Kickstarter for a book called The Four Towers. Let me, let me see if I can, um, if I can Google that. Uh. Bob for towers, uh, the free company of of the the free companies of four towers is a new game that he is going to put out that's much more of a high fantasy dungeon delving Greyhawk style um, game, but is based on Shadow of the Demon Lord rules. And uh, I played a play test of it um, in Winter Fantasy, although it was full Schwab, full un uncensored Schwab, so it felt very much like a Shadow of the Demon Lord game. It was one of the worst things that's ever happened to a character. It might happen in that one. Uh, so that one I'm looking forward to because I like the idea of a um, a high fantasy version of Shadow of the Demon Lord that doesn't have this this focus on uh, uh, that doesn't have this focus on 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 gore and on madness and on you know horror fantasy. I'm I'm interested in seeing a high fantasy version. On the other hand, it's like well I have a high fantasy game and it's called Dungeons and Dragons and I like playing it a lot. So do I really need another one of those? I don't know. But whatever, it's cool. I'm going to buy it. Uh, Zed101 says, have you tried Fate Core? I like that system and I was looking to apply Lazy DM. Yes, I, uh, as you will note, uh, some of the language used in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master is in fact from Fate, uh, including Aspects. Uh, yes, I love Fate. It is probably my favorite rules light system. Uh, I think I like it. A lot of people like the Power by the Apocalypse and some other systems. I find Fate to be a really wonderful, uh, light, story-focused system because you can do character creation in like five minutes. Uh, I like it so much, I wrote a tiny RPG called uh, Dungeons of Fate, uh, which was my... Uh, let's take a look here. I'll drop it into chat. And I will paste it into uh, one of the windows here. Which window has this one? Uh, so Dungeons of Fate, uh, I, 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 I liked it so much. And the thing that Fate has that I really have not seen in any other RPG is that you can build powerful characters in like five minutes with no, you know, you don't have to have pregens. So, you know, you can start with a really, like I built this sort of, pseudo fake old school thing here and essentially what you come up with is like what's the name of your character what is your character's concept and that could be like a race or a class and what trouble do they have and then put your attributes where you want them and you're off to the races and the cool thing is you can sort of build your character if you think about how shadow lets your character get built out every session in dungeons of fate you can actually have your character growing during the session so that way you can get really start you know, build an interesting character that's really tailored around what you like very quickly and then let that character grow as you as you play. Um 
Yeah, Fate's got the yeah, systems for everything. In fact, I wrote a, you know, you could tell how much I like Fate. Um, I wrote a game called Aeon Wave. Uh, Aeon Wave was my Fate-based, um, this is my Fate-based cyberpunk game. Uh, in which you are battling for control over an artificial intelligence, or an artificial super intelligence that's trying to take over the world. And uh, I, it's completely based on fate. It's playable with just the fake rule book and this book. It's three bucks. It was my first Kickstarter. Uh, so yeah, it's a really great system for um, being able to build in just about any world. I highly recommend it. I'll actually like Fate Accelerated a little bit better. Uh, Dungeons of Fate is actually more Fate Accelerated than Fate. Aeon Wave is actually based on Fate, but Fate Accelerated is really, really quick. You can buy the book for like five bucks, and it's it's a really thin book that lets you play basically any world you want. So I, I love it. The only thing I don't love about it is it uses weird dice. It uses uh, X and, uh, plus and minus dice. Oh, God. I think I got about two more minutes in me, and then my voice is shot because of my stupid cold. So... Do we have any other things we want to talk about today? Was there anything else on my list? Not really. Yeah, I think we've covered just about everything. Yeah, it uses fudge dice, which are kind of hard to find. I think we're going to call it there, because if not, I'm just going to have a coughing fit on the air, and that's not fun for anybody. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, and have a great day, and I will see you guys all next Sunday. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the show.